whether we recognize it or not, we are so fragile people. We do not know what will happen even today, even next few hours. Um, as Shiloh, during our Thursday night Bible study, we, are, we have been going through the book of John, and we are on chapter 6. Jesus, with his disciples, after he per performed the miracles with the five loaves and two fish, this is a particular miracle he not only performed, but also he invited his disciples to perform this miracle. So the disciples watched their hands, and out of their hands, they saw bread and fish being multiplied and be able to feed 5,000 men, meaning there were probably over 20,000 people, including the women and the children. But these disciples, even though they were so excited and they probably thought they were somebody's, you know, wow, look at my hands and so forth. But they had absolutely no idea after just a few hours later, they would be roaring and toiling against the storm and they couldn't go any further through the Sea of Galilee. Us, our life is like that. We may enjoy victory today, but tomorrow, what kind of calamities and persecutions and trials are waiting for us? We are so fragile. As we continue on with the story of David, we will see, because in just a few days, in fact, in a couple more days, David will be elevated at least to be the king of Judah. But on that day, He'll be utterly humiliated and put down, perhaps until now, that he has entered in to the lowest part of his life. But he has absolutely no idea in a couple more days that elevation, promotion of his life is waiting for him. You know, last year, along with Deacon Brian and Deacon Ann, we went to um, uh, Tajikistan to Dusanbe, and there were uh, rectors, and uh, the missionary Choi is the father of our beloved Deacon, Deacon Esther. And after TD was done, and we had a, a wonderful time in the power of the Holy Spirit, and uh, missionary Choi decided to feed us with uh, the uh, amazing um, lamb chops, and in the restaurant, we were conversing and sharing testimonies and so forth. And then he shared this testimony. Year 2000, October, there was a bomb, terrorist bomb uh, by extremist Muslims in that land against the church. And 10 of his church members were murdered and with many, many casualties. And he was, this was a trying time for him. And all the church... Church members were really saddened by this occasion, lost their brothers and sisters and, and so forth. But he shared, God used this calamity to elevate this church. Because until then, Sammin Church, Dusanbe Sammin Church was unknown to the world. But by the media and so forth, that he himself was elevated together with the church and the financial support, the prayer support came in and God used to further this church to evangelize the people in Tajikistan. And he was invited by many, many church, churches to be able to share the testimony and talk about Muslim and Muslim evangelism. We do not know what awaits tomorrow, next year. And sometimes God will allow humiliation calamities in our lives. And when we go through that, we doubt about God's love. We doubt about God's goodness. We feel like God is cursing me and judging me. But this is a way of God preparing us to elevate us, promote us abundantly to bless us. At the same time, God also had to bring corrections in the life of David and also ours as well. So we are going to continue on with the story of David, how particularly in the chapter 30, God is truly humbling David right before elevation to be 
the next king of Judah, and later on, Israel. But I want to give you a background a little bit because we are skipping a few chapters. As we saw last week, that, that he wanted to kill Nabal because he was repaying good with the evil, and he was stopped by Abigail. And then the following chapter, there was another chance that God delivered Saul into the hands of David. However, again, he spared his life again. But afterwards, David, a man after God's own heart, the man with a strong faith who was able to destroy the giant Goliath with a, a stone in his sling, but his faith began to be deteriorated and be shaken, and he began to assume protection of his life by his own hands. And it's written in the First Samuel chapter 27, verse 1. This is what David decides, and it displeases God. Chapter 27, verse 1. And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me anymore in any part of Israel, so shall escape out of his hand. Now, this is a displeasing to the Lord. Why? Because God thus far has been his own refuge and the wall and protector. However, he was afraid and frightened, and by this time, maybe he got fed up, and he was so tired of running away from King Saul. So he decided to hide himself and seek out the refuge from the hands of his own enemies, Philistines. And he goes to Gath and to King Achish, the king of Gath, the Philistine. And he seeks a refuge, asylum from him. Now, he didn't want to stay in the capital of Philistine, which is Gath, because at least he had some sober mind and had asked him, give me a place, a piece of land, because I don't want to dwell with you, because I might be a, a despised in the eyes of your own people. So Achilles gave him Ziggurat. Ziggurat used to belong and be the part of the land of Judah. However, when Palestine grew stronger, they were invade Ziggurat, and at that time, Ziggurat was under control of Palestine. So David and his 600 men and their children and their wives will go there. But still, he will go by the disguise against the king Achish and will go and fight against the Jolites and Zerites. I cannot even name them correctly, Amalekites, and fight against them and annihilate completely. And God will still graciously give him victories. However, there is a perpetual sin against God. And God had to deal with that and correct him before God elevates him to be the king of Judah. And then Philistines decide to invade Judah again. So they're gathering all the soldiers and army up in the city called Aphek. And I want to show you a diagram or map and, and let us know what's happening exactly. So this is a Jiglag and southern part of Judah. It used to be Judah. Now it's under control of Philistine. The cities of Philistines are these, Gaza, Ascalon, and Ashad. So they are gathering together to Aphek to fight against the, uh, King Saul and his army. And later on, eventually, they will go to Zezreel. And as we know, later chapters, we will know on the mountain Gilboa, and there is a great battle. There, King Saul gets killed and with his uh, three sons. Now, uh, Saul, King David, and 600 men joined together to Aphek, to Philistines, to fight against King Saul, to his own people. Of course, David will never do that, but by disguise, at least that's what he says to, king, uh, to the king of Philistine. But then, later on, the princes of 
Philistines find out David's in the midst of them. So they're becoming angry. And they go to Achilles. What are you doing? This is David. Remember? Remember what the Jewish people and women used to dance and sing along? Because King Saul killed a thousand, but David killed ten thousands. This is he. Why would you include him in the battle? Along the way, he's going to turn his heart and he's going to fight against us, send him away and his men. So they were cast out from the Philistine army. So it takes about three days journey back to their home to Chiklag and they're coming back. David and his men. And that's where we are, we are going to pick up the story and learn from the story, how man's remorse can be completely turned into God's abundant restoration. And there is a great lesson that we can learn from this story. So let's pick it up from 1 Samuel chapter 30, from verse 1 through 19. And let us alternate. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and attacked the Ziklag and burned it with a fire. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with a fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. And there... And David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Zezerlilites, something like that, and Abigail and the widow of Nabal, the common knight, had been taken captive. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the effort here to me. And Abiathar brought the effort to David. So David went, he and his, the 600 men who were with him, and came to Brook Beshor, where those stayed who were left behind. Then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, and they let him drink water. Then David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man from Egypt, a servant of Malachi, and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. And David said to him, Can you take me down to this trip? So he said, I swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this troop. Then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except the 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. Verse 19 altogether. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or gray, sons or daughters, spoil or anything, which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Why Ziklag was raided? Why was it looted? David was still going around and fighting against the enemies of God, and he was victorious. 
Seemed like everything was going okay. And he was rescued by Philistine and Saul was no longer chasing after him. And seemed like it's, everything is okay. And to their surprise, to their shocking, when they returned home to Jekulog, the city was completely burnt down and remained with the ashes. And there was no single man or woman left. And all their wives, all their children became captives of Amalekites. And they returned home and they only saw and confronted calamities. Why? Why was this happen? Although Amalekites invaded the city, although its enemy, not God himself, or giving this calamity, but we know everything is allowed by God. God who has been protecting David thus far and has brought such victories thus far, why would God allow this calamity to David and to his followers? Because there's a lesson, lesson to take. God wanted to correct David. According to Book of Proverbs, chapter 26, verse 2, it says, Like a fleeting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. Any calamity, any seemingly curse of happening in our life is without, not without cause. Perhaps because of our sin, it opens a door for enemies to come in and invade our life, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it was exactly for David, even though seemingly in his life he was continually victorious. However, God had to deal with his sinning against God. Because not relying upon God fully, he turned his heart to his enemies, to Philistines, and finding refuge there and relying upon mere the people and even his enemies. And there he had to put up a show for one and a half years because he has to constantly lie to a kid. And that's not a godly leader. And God had to deal with it. And the only way to deal with that sin and perpetual sin, even by that time, David probably couldn't recognize that he was severely sinning against God and God was so displeased with it until God would allow calamity in his life. It's the same way with our own life. You know, when our parents are ailing and they become over 70s and 80s and they go through uh, the cancer or death, it's hard for children. But we understand because that's common knowledge in the life. We lose our beloved ones when the time comes. However, when something happens to our children and something happens to me and I begin to have a sickness and cancer and I am only in early 30s and then these are calamities and sudden invasion to our lives that we are struck with the suffering and pain and trials in our lives, then we cry out. And our natural response is a complaining and murmuring against God. And we begin to blame other people why this happened. And we criticize the circumstances. But when unexpected calamity happens in our life, the only way, the best way, is to come before the Lord with a broken and contrite heart. And instead of beginning to blame the people surrounding your life and criticize the circumstance, circumstances and complain against God, examine your own life. Whether your sin has opened the door to your own enemies. So this calamity has happened. We believe David did that exactly. Because later on we see when his men began to talk about stoning him because they were so devastated because they lost their wives and their children. But in the midst of it, he was comforted and he was encouraged in the Lord. 
we don't know the full content of the prayer that he offered before God, but we can assume, of course, there must be repentance, that his life was corrected in order for him to invite abundant restoration to his loss. And that should be a similar approach to our own life. Because of whatever happens in an event of our life, there is always a lesson. There's always a voice from God. There's always a teaching of the Lord. We need to have two perspectives of whether it's a calamity or blessing that happened in our life. Why? Because there is a perspective of physical, in the physical realm, why this happened and that happened. To David, yes, he was a foolish. He should have left some soldiers with the women, with the children, not leaving them that vulnerable. And when he went to his own batteries, that can be physical interpretation. But that's not the all. Because if we do not take any event in our life, whether suffering, whether trial, calamities, blessings, and bring it to the spiritual realm to be able to interpret it correctly in the eyes of the Lord, we will never grow. Our faith, our maturity in Christ will never be enhanced because we need to understand why God allowed this, why God is trying to teach us, why he allowed this to me so that I can hear his voice because sometimes calamity is God's own full-blown stereo system and speaking to us with the two largest speakers. But sometimes if we continually murmur and complain against God and blame others and also justify my own sin and continually excuse with my compromises, that calamity may continually endure in my life. Instead of restoration, my heart will be continually hardened and bitter against God. Then you have no source of healing, restoration. But David was a man after God's own heart. He was able to recognize his own sin, probably repented, and he will not only be encouraged in the Lord, but he was able to of the Lord to find the way for full-blown restoration. And that should be our own approach as well. Whatever happens unexpectedly to our dislike, to our despise, God allowed it. Humbly let us come before Him with a trembling heart and examine our conduct, our lifestyle, our words, our heart in alignment of God's Word through the scriptures in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us fully repent, repent, and repent and allow God to heal us and restore us. Then, secondly, as we know the story, he is a 600 man who will risk their lives to fight against the enemies. They honor David's leadership. They love him. They follow. And they go through all kinds of trials together. But they are also weak human vessels. When it comes to a point, their own life is greatly disadvantaged by the flaw of their leaders. Soon they will turn and begin to stone him. That's how we are. We are so fragile. We are so weak. I'm a pastor, and I know exactly what this means. So many brothers and sisters that will come to me, Pastor Shai, we love you. We honor you. you. You are a great leader, and I have grown so much by your teaching. I got blessed, and I, you go through the sickness, and I pray for you, and by the grace of God, you get healed. But I know also how that I can have you Exit out of this church so fast, it will only take two minutes. Because if I sharply rebuke you and hurt you to the core, you will flat out leave me. And there were people like that. If anything that it core to the core of your treasure, what you possess, 
dearly and hold on to dearly and it's been damaged and it's been disadvantaged and it's been lost because of me, because of your leader, because of his failure, because he's a stupid decision, whatever it may be, you are flat out. Minimum, leave. If not, try to stone him or her to death. Let us not overestimate us, the humanity. We are so fragile. We are so weak. We are all self-centered. When it comes down to what I dearly treasure, and when it is disadvantaged by anyone else, we will immediately grab a stone and try to destroy and take vengeance on him. And that's exactly what's happening. But to David, this is a lost point because he was rejected by his own father and his own brothers. And he's been chased by the king, Saul, for many, many years. He tried to find a refuge from Philistine. Now from Philistine, he got rejected again. Now he's a 600 man. He thought they were faithful followers. They were just lay their own neck for the purpose of God. But when they lost their wives and their children, immediately they planned to kill their leader. And in that lost the peat in that moment, there's no one he can turn to except God and him alone. That's why their brothers and sisters, no matter what kind of position you may be, no matter how, what kind of leadership you may exercise, let us not rely upon the people. The followers, although they may love you, they may faithfully serve you, and by heart and soul, they may be with you, but they are not the source of your reliance. They are not the source of your trust. Only God is the source of your trust and reliance. They are the objects of your love and your service, not the trust. They're all fragile. And that's why every one of us, we need a God. And we find the strength in Him, not in the people. When we seek out comforts and encouragement by the people, I guarantee you, you'll be utterly disappointed, if not hurt by the people. And again, David comes, kneels down before God, and he is strengthened and comforted by Him and Him alone. He is true comforter. He is true encourager. He is the source that He can lift us up from the dungeon. Then there's a great attribute of David. Again, here we find that is in the midst of this, he inquires of the Lord again and again. Although seemingly this is an impossible situation, he looks at the city. All the remainings are just the ashes. But he trusts in the Lord because he knows God can turn ashes into the beauty. According to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, this is one of my favorite verses of the Bible. He's talking about coming Messiah who will console those who mourn in Zion. But the next line, this is, I love it. To give them beauty for ashes. What are ashes? You know, Korean people, we love to have a barbecue. After barbecue, you use a charcoal, and charcoals are all burnt down, and you see less than dust. Ashes, it's done. It's beyond the hope. You cannot redeem anything out of ashes. You cannot use it for nothing good. But what God is saying is, you say this is beyond destruction, beyond hopelessness, but I can create a flowers out of these ashes and I will replace your ashes with the beauty. When we lose a hope in our life, when we say, this is, I'm done, I'm finished, this is the end of the road, then God says, that's a perfect time for me to come in and turn the ashes into your flowers and make a beauty out of ashes. And David knew that. David knew that. It was impossible. What happened to the promise of God? Wasn't I anointed to be the next king? Not my own fellow 
soldiers who were deserted, who were socially outcast, who were ostracized, who were bankrupt, and I brought them in. I embraced them. And until now, I was their leader. Now they're trying to kill me. At that moment, where is a promise? Where is a hope? Where is my future? But yet, by kneeling down before the Lord, he will regain the strength. Not only that, he will inquire of the Lord. He will inquire of the Lord. He will ask God, what now, Lord? What is my next step? What do you want me to do? Are you going to deliver Amalekites into my hands? Should I pursue after them? God says, you will. Are you going to deliver them into my hands? I will. I will fully restore all you have lost. And with that voice, he will get up and re-encourage his followers and chase after Amalekites. And by his divine appointment, and there's an Egyptian young man who was cast out by a Malachi master, and he's the informer and knows exactly where the truth is, and he goes and fights against them. And God, our God, is a full restorer. Not only they were able to restore all the wives and children back to them, but all the spoils that were stolen returned back, but plus, plus, because these Amalekites, not only they went to Ziggurat, but they went to different areas and brought so many spoils. And these possessions became David's and their followers. Not only God restored them what they lost, but even more what caused by the sin of David. God will repay him with his abundant grace and generosities and blessings. And God is a pro in this. We know the story with Abraham. Abraham was like a David. God told him, go to the land that I will show you. It was the land of Canaan. And immediately when he arrived, there was a famine. And now we're lying upon God, looking at the circumstances, the famine, he decides to go down to Egypt. Egypt signifying the world, not godly kingdom. And there he was humiliated and humbled because he ended up lying to King Pharaoh sounded like a David to protect himself that his wife was a sister. And they were both humbled, but when they returned back to the land of Canaan, God would give him such great possessions, he became and came back richer, much, much richer than before. There's another story. Jacob, God blessed him so much during the years when he was in the house of Laban, his uncle, even though he went down with empty hands, when he was returning back to the land of Judah, he brought so many children and so many family members with a great possession. He became a very rich man, but he forgot his vow, covenant he made with his God. He had to go back to the Bethel where he will rebuild the altar and offer him the offerings to him saying, you are my God and I am your people. But instead, he forgot. He was not where he should be, but instead, he settled down in the Shechem. And in the Shechem, Shechem, son of Havor, raped his daughter, Dinah. And that calamity triggered Jacob what he has been doing wrong. And he repented and gathered his family members and let us go to the bathroom and build the altar there. And when he was going up to the bathroom, God was a, so much protective of Jacob. The Bible says all the people surrounding him were stricken with a fear and no one was able to touch Jacob and his descendants. That's how generous, gracious our God is. Even through our sins, even through our failures, even through our flaws and faults, even when we invite invasions of our enemies and we are devastated, we are humiliated, we are broken by calamities. When we correct ourselves through the repentance and when we make our ways right with the Lord, not only God restores what has been lost, 
but he abundantly gives us more, more, and more. That's how wonderful, amazing our God is. That's gracious God, a man after God's own heart that David experienced. So why he has it become? Because he tasted the grace of God, because he experienced the generosity of God, he becomes a generous leader. Because the leaders are generous. You cannot be leading people unless you are generous. You need to be generous before God first. Those are people who don't give a tithing, let me challenge you. You will never become generous to anyone. Because unless you become honorable before the Lord, starting with the tithing and giving to the Lord, you will not be able to become generous leaders. Because God, Jesus already said, it's better to give than to receive. Give and it will be returned back to you. Fully returned back to your bosom. Overwhelmingly. That's what the Bible says. Our church is abounded by the generosity. Our founding pastor, Pastor Kim, even though after he retired, I will hear numerous stories and testimonies how he and this church was so generous to the people even not associated with the GMI. You, you know Korean Broadcasting, Christian Broadcasting Company. That company was trying to acquire a building and they had a hard time settling down. But this church and our founding pastor graciously gave large lump sum of money that were able to acquire a building and begin the Korean Christian Broadcasting Company some years ago. Why am I sharing this? Because David, when he has a return to the broke Bashor, there were 200 men who got so tired, physically exhausted after three days of travel from APAC coming to Ziggurat, and also emotionally drained after they witnessed their wives and children were gone. And they had no strength to go after Amalekites. So they decided, 200 of them remaining on the brook Bashor. So when they returned after victory, these 400 men who fought against Amalekites, they said, we have no business with these guys. They didn't fight with us. So send them away. Let's just give their wives and children back, but no spoils are shared with them. Let them go. But David says, no. This will be a perpetual ordinance for the nation of Israel. Whether those people who are remaining behind the brook, those people who fought against our enemies, they will get the same reward, same inheritance, and spoils divided. Those are people who take the gospel to the India, Sri Lanka, to the mission field. Those are people who stay behind the home and intercede and financially give. Same rewards is given by our generous God. This church, this leadership was founded by generosity. Another story. When I was officiating funeral service for Alice and Hannah's mother in that mortuary, I'm waiting until the time. And the pastor the owner of that mortuary comes to my waiting room and begins to converse with me. Where are you from? I'm from Grace and I'm an EM pastor and so forth. Then he tells me this story. You know, many years ago, I was suffering financially. I was selling the graveyard spots of Rose Hill to make a living. And I had a vision to create a mortuary for Korean Christian people, but I had no money. So I went to Grace Church to Pastor Kim, the founding pastor. He graciously gave, gave me time even during Sunday service that I was able to make an announcement. And he encouraged all the church mem members to buy the graveyard spot. Some kind of announcement during Sunday service. And so many people bought the site from there. Not only he was able to regain strength in the finance, but also be able to buy, acquire mortuary, and today I'm running it continually for Korean community. Pastor Han, so generous. Each year he will gather all the retired pastors, not associated with GMI, any pastors, during the month of 
family, month of May, we will feed them with the food and celebration, with the, with the entertainment. That's just one simple example. Last night was the last night of 40-day prayers that he decides to give a gift to the church members. Not only those people who've been diligent in coming out for less than 40 days, but if you come just only one night, last night, we consider you been coming out faithfully, so we give, we give you the gifts for all 3,000 people. This church is found by generosity. I was talking with another brother a few days ago last week. He said uh, he visited a church to their cell meetings, and it was a, a culture shock for him. Because not only they meet only once in a month, but all the cell members, when they meet together, they need to buy their own food and bring their own food to the cell meeting. And that was a culture shock for him. Why? Because our EM cell leaders, they use their own money pre to prepare all the food for their cell members, not only for once in a month, but at least three times in a month. And they will joyfully and generously will do that. A man after God's own heart, to be a leader, has to be generous. Not giving any spoil to those people who remained behind the brook vessel is illogical. That's a common sense. But our God is not logical or runs by common sense. He was wasteful to give his only son Jesus on that cross for the people just like you and I who are so wicked, who do not deserve any. Good thing from God deserves hell, but God will have this worst exchange of human history, replacing our sin with his holy child, Jesus Christ. He is a generous God, and we need to resemble his generosity. But this generosity, I don't know, I know it doesn't come naturally. I, I think I am very generous towards God because I give sometimes too much. I have no money left to be generous to the people. You know, a few days ago after 40-day prayer from the vision center, Mrs. Han found me and she said, I have some leftover selangtang. Would you like to take it home? Because she knew my wife and children were in Korea, so she had a pity on me so I can have some food at home. And as a pastor, you know, it's not too dignifying carrying leftover food in the parking lot so that church members see pastors. So I was a little bit reluctant, but, you know, I didn't want to reject her with generosity, so I said yes. So she took me to the Pastor Han's office, and she gave me a box. I thought it was a, like just one white form of the salangtan, the beef broth, but it was a whole box, and there was a large jar of kimchi chige and two white forms of radish kimchi and cabbage kimchi, solangtang, and maybe other stuff. And I'm carrying this large box in the parking lot. Then, alas, I see missionary couples, the Egyptian missionary couples who recently visited Korea and came back. And I was so excited to see them, and then I look at my box. Oh, man, these are for them, not mine. So I give them, go ahead, and oh, they said, this is too much, too much. But, you know, give, um, if you don't want to take all, just like, you know, I'm giving salangtang and all that, trying to be generous. And I come home, there's a white foam. The, out of whatever I have given them, I have one jar of kimchi chige and one white foam of kimchi. And I open it up, and that's radish kimchi, not the cabbage one. But I prefer cabbage one. I like a cabbage much more than the radish one because I make a kimchi chicken out of it. Then I said, oh, man, I gave a wrong wife on. Talking about generosity. We can be such a stingy and selfish people. But by the mercy of God, the more we experience the generosity of God, and mercy of Jesus Christ, God help us to be more generous. Because this church, from the beginning, gave more than 50% of church finance 
for other nations, for other people other than us. This church has laid with a spirit of generosity. Their brothers and sisters begin to give. Give to God first and give to others and see how God abundantly repays you more than you deserve. Let us all rise. Are you experiencing hurt, wounds, trial, even calamities? Do you feel you are being judged by God? Not so. God wants you to make it right. Because He's not concerned with what you possess, what you have uh, accomplished. He's more concerned with your character. Because he wants to draw out of you Christ's likeness. Because that's what this dark world must see. And only when you are right with God, your heart is fully given to him, and your life lived according to his word, then God can elevate you. If you feel like you are utterly humiliated, humbled, and broken, rejoice in the Lord. Perhaps you are only two days apart from his elevation and promotion of your life. But repentance must come. Before restoration, repentance, turning your heart, turning your lifestyle fully back to God is a prerequisite of full-blown restoration for your life. The brothers and sisters, I long, I crave for tsunami-like revival that may happen within our ministry, within our people, personally, in and out, from in and out, that I want to experience powerful transformation of my heart and my life. And maybe people there. God may allow trials, sufferings, calamities, and pains in our lives. Because oftentimes our ears are so dull. Unless He speaks to us with a loud speakerphone called the calamities, we may not get it. So it's loving hands of God. Because He plans for good, hope, salvation, restoration blessings shall we come before the Lord with a repentance whatever you need to have it right whatever you've been suffering don't avoid it don't blame others don't murmur against God go through right at it look at it have a reflection of your own life your heart condition repent repent before God Get it right with the Lord. Receive His loving corrections because restoration waits for you. Let's call His name and pray together. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.